Oh, Father, we thank you tonight. Thank you, Jesus. We magnify you tonight, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, you kept us alive. Lord, you kept us sane. Hallelujah. With the right mind, Lord. You've kept us under pressure. You kept us, Lord. In our trials, you've kept us, Lord. Through every tribulation, you brought us, Father. Oh, God, even when we messed up, you kept us, Lord. Hallelujah. Even when we went down the wrong path, even when we made the wrong choice, you gave us your grace, Lord. Oh, the spirit of grace, hallelujah. Fill us with that spirit, Lord. Hallelujah. Grace to overcome ourselves, Lord. Grace to overcome every trial, Lord. Hallelujah. Every trial, every fiery trial, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for the grace to overcome. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness, Lord. Your faithfulness never fails. Your compassion never fails, Lord. Hallelujah. Fill us, Lord, with faithfulness and compassion as well. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. Father, we submit our spirits to you tonight, Lord. Our soul, our, even our bodies, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Oh, sanctify us with your word. Sanctify us with your truth, Lord. Hallelujah. If there be any error in us, hallelujah. Oh, God, hallelujah. Show us, Lord God, our ways, Lord. Oh, try our hearts, Lord God. Try, try our hearts, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, God, and create in us a clean heart. Hallelujah. Oh, purge us with hyssop. We shall be clean. Wash us. We'll be whiter than snow. Oh, God, make us to hear joy and gladness, Lord. That the bones which you have broken may rejoice. Hallelujah. Oh, God, fill us with the Holy Ghost again. Hallelujah. Baptize us in your presence. Baptize us with your love. Baptize us with your spirit. Father God, hallelujah. We bind every work of the enemy tonight. Hallelujah. Oh, God, we stop every work of the enemy tonight. Oh, God, we fight back against the enemy. Oh, God, not with weapons of flesh, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, God, but by your word tonight. Hallelujah. It is written we are healed. It is written we are healed, Lord. We are delivered. We are set free. We are saved. Hallelujah. Sanctified. Hallelujah. Oh, God. Hallelujah. Baptized with your spirit. Hallelujah. Washed in the water. Hallelujah. Of your word, Father. It is written we are more than conquerors. It is written we are overcomers, Lord. In the name of Jesus with the blood that your son shed on Calvary. Hallelujah. It is written. It is finished. Hallelujah. Oh, God. Hallelujah. Destroy the enemy's hands tonight. Break his ankles tonight in the name of Jesus. Oh, in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, loose up in here, Lord. Send the power of the Holy Ghost, the authority from on high to bind on earth what's bound in heaven. Loose here on earth hallelujah oh god what is loosed in heaven let your kingdom come and lord god let our kingdoms go hallelujah oh god let your kingdom come as we let our kingdoms go hallelujah let your kingdom come oh god as we let our kingdom go lord god bring your kingdom reign in our hearts lord and be the true lord of our lives be the true lord of our lives we welcome you into our hearts as lord Adonai, we welcome you into our hearts as, a, as Lord of Lords, Lord over our flesh, Lord over our will, Lord over our emotions, Lord over, over our spirit, Father, hallelujah. Oh God, take us and make us and shape us and form us, mold us, mold us, conform us into your image and your likeness hallelujah oh namashatayaba hey please jesus we can't do it without you hallelujah we can't do it without you lord hallelujah give us this day hallelujah our daily bread oh shema hey give us this day our daily bread lord oh forgive us our trespasses lord we forgive every every soul that's ever trespassed against us since the day we've been born, we forgive them, Lord. 
We forgive them, Lord. We forgive them. We forgive them. Oh, we forgive them. Lead us not into temptation, God, but deliver us from the evil one. Thine is the kingdom, the power, Lord God. The power and the glory. We need your glory in this earth. In these earthen vessels, fill us with your glory. We know that you don't dwell in temples made with hands. But we are tabernacles for your presence. Fill us as you filled Solomon's temple. As you filled the tabernacle. Fill us. Fill us, Lord, with your presence. We'll be ever grateful. The words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. Oh, Lord, our strength, yes, our strength and our redeemer. Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Yeah, we bless your name. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory. Hallelujah. We bless your name. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to see everybody tonight. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, everybody. And everybody ought to what? Yeah, 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 yeah. We greet you in that name, Lord Jesus Christ. Man, it's good to see y'all. I'm happy to be back in the house. Y'all happy to be here? Yeah. Amen, amen. I'm happy to see y'all. Uh, missed y'all? <laughs> but we are here. We are here. We're here. The Washingtons are here. Hicks, y'all here, man? Look at everybody here. <laughs> so glad I'm here. In Jesus' name. I mean, I had a good day today, a very good day. Um, Sister Chisholm's mom passed away, and uh, the home going was today. So uh, the wife and I, we was able to go to the home going, and, and um, I can give a good report. Everything went well. It was a beautiful service, good word, good encouraging word, uh, some good song singing. You know, that's what we do when we come together and lose somebody. You know, we got to come together and encourage and and so I know they were encouraged. The family was encouraged. And uh, then we snuck over to uh, her mom's house where the repast was. And, and we, we stayed there for a while, too, and just fellowshiped. As a matter of fact, it was so good. Um, we, we, Deacon Chisholm and, and, and I were sitting in the corner eating some of the, all that good food. And, uh, and talked to another uh, woman of God. And, and, man, we just started having church, man. We just, we just fellowshipping and testifying and giving our testimonies and just talking about the, the goodness of the Lord. And, and this lady came walking in, and she, she had, she, I could tell there was something wrong with her back because she was kind of bent over and a lot of pain and stuff. But she came in, and, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't know who this lady was, um, but she kind of looked through everybody, and she was like, she's like, Pastor, Pastor. And I'm like, I don't know who this lady is. And she's like, uh, you don't know, but I, I watch First Fruits every Sunday. Every Sunday. I watch First Fruits every Sunday. And she's like, I'm going to be making my way there real soon. I was like, what? So we just started fellowshipping and talking and, and, and just you know, enjoying God's presence. And um, she, was, she was telling another young lady about her issue with her back, and she had a pinched nerve. Her father just passed away, and, um, and she had a lot of stuff to do, but something happened to her back, and she got a, this pinched nerve. And, and um, so the young lady next to me, she was, she was telling her, like, you know, the doctor said she might have to get some type of surgery or something. And so the young lady was like, well, you know, if the doctor said that, then, you know, you do what you got to do. And then something leaped in my spirit, man. I said, I said, yeah, that's, that's, that's right. You know, I mean, we thank God for them doctors, but I know a doctor that could do the surgery, you know, w without you having to go get surgery. And the whole, I'm telling y'all, ooh, like I feel right now, the whole house shifted, man. The presence of God came in there, and she looked up, and I was like, and, and I sat down next to her, and I, and I, and I was just, I can't remember what I said, because I was in, in, in that realm then. And I was like, um, but, you know, I was, I was like, you know what the Bible says? I was like, you know, with the stripes, we heal. I was like, we lay hands on the sick, and, and they recover. I was like, you know, everywhere Jesus went, 
he healed them, you know. So, so man, look, at that time, everybody's attention was on Jesus, man. Not on me, on Jesus. And I was like, so I'm going, I was like, can I lay hands on you? And we, can we pray? And she was like, yes, man. We went into prayer, y'all, up in that house. And it was fire, man. It was so powerful. And the Lord touched her. And, um, and man, we was in there rejoicing. And even when she stood up, she stood up more straight, man. And I was like, that woman going to get a miracle. I, I just believe God going to touch her and, um, because his presence did it, man. So, so let's just rejoice now. Uh, I think her name is, I might get it wrong, but I think it's Sister Jeanette. Amen, amen. We, we praising God for what he's doing. Amen, amen. It's just amazing what God does. Ain't nothing too hard for God. Look at somebody say, ain't nothing too hard. Ain't, ain't, ain't nothing too hard for God. What is there that's too hard for God? You tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. What is it? Too hard? The only thing I know that's hard for God is for him to fail. <laughs> he can't fail. Amen. He'll never fail. He's, he's everlasting, man. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so it's him we worship tonight. It's him we declare tonight. And it's him that we're just so grateful for tonight. So, again, it's good to see all of you. It's, it's really good to see y'all uh, in this house. And we're going to continue down this road of discipleship. Because it's the rest of our life anyway, so we're going to spend some good time. We're going to keep on flipping over some leaves and keep on discovering a little bit more. But tonight specifically, we're going to talk about just the high price of discipleship, all right? So if there's one word, honestly, that I would want you to kind of go back home and meditate on is the word commitment. That, that one word. So put that somewhere in your notes or put that in your pocket, put that on your phone or or put it in your mind, and everybody shout out loud, it's a commitment. Because discipleship requires commitment. It, it, I mean, it requires commitment. Jesus requires us to be committed uh, to being disciples and to making disciples, you know. And so sometimes, sometimes I, I believe, you know, looking just at discipleship as a whole, looking at church history, looking at my experiences, and you might see some of this as well as that a lot, a lot of um, just in general, you know, congregations um, have pastors that are too easy on them when it comes down to discipleship. They, they, they're just, just too easy on them. I mean, just in general, you know, not knocking nothing, just kind of just putting the truth out there. A lot, a lot of uh, congregations, you, know, you don't really hear so much about discipleship or some really good deep teaching and, and really the act of discipleship. Uh, it, it's in, in, and I start thinking about, you know, maybe there's some traditions that got in the way to cause that to happen, right? Maybe some, some of that easygoing attitude uh, towards members of congregations was because of the fact that people um, maybe thought discipleship was only um, for certain personality types, you know? You know, sometimes, oh, the evangelists, are the discipleship makers. You know, you got people that think kind of that way that, you know, discipleship making is just for like those people that got that exuberant personality like myself that, that can go out and reach souls and, you know, bring them into the kingdom. But that's, that's, just, that's just the beginning, you know. So maybe it's rooted in some of that. Maybe it's rooted in some of those things. But, um, but uh, we, we, we got to kind of lift up this bar, this expectation. Jesus has said it. And we got to take this expectation and lift it up before the saints, before y'all, and really say, have we been too easy on this whole discipleship thing, right? And, and everybody say commitment again. Say it out loud because that's what it's going to take. It's going to take a different level of commitment than, than we're on right now, right? So thinking, you know, and only you can really assess yourself, you know, wh where are you is a good question. Like where am I at in my discipleship making and being a disciple and making disciples, What's my commitment level? Because remember, this, this price is high. So we got to take this long, hard look at, at really doing the business of the Great Commission. And that's what we've been doing, you know, over the past week since God has laid this on my heart um, to, to really start looking at, you know, uh, you know, it's easy to do the things to, to bring people in. It's easy to go out there and have a praise in the park. You know, we're probably going to try to do something like that soon. Or, you know, it's easy to go knocking door to door or putting up some flyers online and doing all these things that we do to attract people to the Lord. But at the end of the day is Jesus had in mind that we got to get out here and make disciples, right? So, so, so we got to reconsider. We got to start thinking differently about, you know, what is our responsibility? You know, I mean, golly, God saved us when he saved us, and here we are now. We have a responsibility now, a big responsibility to figure out what does this look like. And so, and so um, it's all about, you know, getting, you know, biblically honest with ourselves and looking at this price. It's all about reevaluating ourselves, 
right? Daily, you know, I like that scripture talks about try my heart, you know, it's like, it's like, okay, Lord, let me really look at my heart. Help me look at my heart to see, am I, am I, am I a good disciple in the first place, <laughs> right? Am I one of them disciples that you, you proud of or, you know, do I have some room to grow? <laughs> and, uh, and, and then, you know, how, how can I make disciples? I think all these questions are good. And I believe like, you know, as we go through this stuff, you know, God's probably dropping these little nuggets in your heart and you're able to go back home and start really thinking about this and, and doing things maybe differently. So, so, but, but as a pastor of this house, I think I made it really clear, like, 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 like this is the year of the pivot, you know? So, so we pivoting in every perspective that we can. And, and a, another big part of this pivot is going to be our, our moving from church membership to church disciples. We, we're, we're disciples now. We're, we're not doing this whole member thing. You know, we're, we're church disciples. We're, we're disciples of the Lord, and that's the pivot. And so, so let's talk a little bit ab- about this, um, uh, about this truth. Um, and it's, it's so I, I got some notes down here. I'm just kind of jumping all over the place. But I, I want to, you know, it, it's interesting when it, you know when you think about expectations it, it, who who who's on somebody's job in here i am i work i work for ihg all right y'all y'all okay y'all work for somebody right or you work for yourself if you work you work for somebody anyways you work for yourself you work for somebody so 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 people have expectations of you right right so so expectations are i think are really important because it clarifies you know what's expected of you and your responsibility and whatever that role is it's the same thing jesus is doing with us he's saying you have a role in the kingdom and i have expectations of you right and 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 so when it, when it gets down to this it's really interesting um because because you know there, there can be you know let, let's flip this to something else real quick like let's, let's talk about like tithing for example why not right that's been a big talk i think over the past few weeks i'm gonna leave it there you know, but think about this, though. You know, if, if you lift the level of giving in a congregation, right, and you start talking about tithing and offerings and giving, right, what, and, you're, and you're, you're asking people to commit to that, right, and, and talk about and teach on it, then the givers get excited and they lift their level of commitment. You'll have some that don't. Which goes to show you they're not those they're not that type they're not that people they're not committed to that, right? And it's easy to focus focus on the ones that aren't, and I think sometimes pastors and leaders have kind of scaled back and pushing commitment because they're afraid of losing. Yeah. Come on up in here, come on. All right, so I'm going somewhere. So so you could talk about that, and then the, the givers are going to be like, let's take it, man. Like you've been giving, but you know what? Have I really? I need to give more. So you know, there's something rise up in you because you understand the principles of giving, right? So you could take that example, um, and, and and you can flip that over to discipleship making, right? So we start putting putting a, a huge expectation in discipleship. What's going to happen is the real disciples are going to stand up. You know, the real disciples are going to say, "All right, yeah, I get it. I'm stepping up." There's going to be some that won't, and that's look, that's that's okay, because that's that's going to be between them and God. But the people in here that have their hearts on becoming disciples are going to push their way out to what to do whatever it takes to get prepped and developed to be be prepared to be that disciple that the Lord is calling them to. So so what what my heart's desire is is I want to, without being that pushy pastor. <laughs> You know, because you can't be, listen, it ain't like, um, you can't beat nothing into nobody. I mean, I ain't saying, you know, you know how people are just, <clears throat> you know, trying to get something, like, that, that That never works. Like, you raise kids, you know, you talk, you know what I'm talking about. Like, like you could say, you could try to, you know, get stuff in them, and that just don't work. You got to try a different approach, right? Right. But, but the approach isn't getting lackadaisical. The approach is just looking at things differently and getting people to see things differently, you know, and the, and, and the why behind the picture, and then, then people will, will get that passion and want to step up and do what they're called to do. That's what I'm talking about. That's my heart's desire is to lift the level of expectation in this house in a way that you're going to go home and, like, you ain't going to be able to shake this thing. Like, you're going to go home, you're going to be thinking, like, you ain't going to be able to get that word commitment out of your spirit. You're, you're not going to get that out of your spirit because you're going you're gonna to go home, you're going to start thinking, like, where am I committed? Where am I not committed? Uh, what, uh, what can I do differently? You know, how can I get better for you, Jesus? What, 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 where, where am I lacking? What are my strengths? You know, you start, these things start coming to your spirit as God start ministering to you and dealing uh, with discipleship, you know, in your hearts. And so, 
So, um, you know, we, we, have to, we have to, I think, really hone in on looking at our personal commitment and then, of course, looking at our corporate commitment as a church when it comes down to being disciples. And so, um, so, so you never know who's in your audience, oh, Jesus, until you start preaching commitment. Yeah, I've learned that, honestly, in my little short, little eight, nine years of pastoral ministry, you know? Um, if every listen, watch this. This is good. If everybody was here that has came here and joined this church, we would have to literally really have the whole building because we've had tons of people come through this ministry. Thank you, Jesus. And I love that because, you know, we've been able to sow word into people's spirit and everybody's not meant to stay. But back going back to what I said, like, you know, who's in the audience when you start preaching commitment, because some people going to step up to it. Some people going to walk away from it. I've learned that when people walk away from commitment, like, like it's like it just is what it is. Of course, you every pastor gonna want somebody. You know, they gonna want people to stay, but there's gonna be a point in time. I mean, I'm gonna show you in the scriptures that it just it don't always happen that way, right? So that's why I'm so thankful for all of you that are here tonight, all of you that are online, amen. Because y'all are look at look at somebody and say I'm committed. Yeah, if you weren't, you wouldn't be here, right? You ain't just here to just chill out. Like y'all ain't here just to have fun, right? You know, you're here to grow, right? Yeah, y'all are committed. So, so you know who's in your in your church, right? Don't don't get don't don't get discouraged when you see some people kind of fall fall away when we start taking it to the next level, because that's what's going to happen. It's happened in this ministry already. One time it was prophesied, uh, Apostle Davenport, uh, when my office was in here, when the church was just this unit. Uh, we had a nice, nice little crowd of people at that time. He said, God is getting ready to take your church and go like this and shake it. And I was like, no, ain't nobody want to hear that message. <laughs> and it would turn over whoever's left is who God got is like basically committed. And I was like, wow. And that thing happened like two, three weeks later. Next thing you know, I was like seeing people leave this way, this way. I was like, you know, I was getting frustrated, upset, and sad and all that. And then I, I went back to, to the word that I received, and I was like, Oh, okay, I see what you're doing, Lord. You're shaking this thing up. You're shaking this thing up. And then, you know, here we are. You know, we got, it, that's the process. It's always going to be that way. Now, what I want you to see, and I want you to feel, I want you to understand, you got to see, only you, only you can say, like, where you are in, in this thing, right, and where you want to be, amen? And so, um, so you know, and, and I, let me add this to this, too. This is, I got a bunch of notes. Like, um, I, I feel... I guess in this contemporary apostolic church, because we're apostolic, you know, one that's apostolic, that we don't see quick growth, like, according to, like, what you see amongst a lot of other churches and stuff, a lot of the denominational organizations. And I think part of that reason is because we preach and we do expect a commitment, right? We, we preach and we do expect a commitment. Like I said, I'm not here to knock nothing. I'm just making a point, right? It, 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 it's our reality. It costs something to be a part of a church that teaches the full gospel. Come on, y'all. Y'all, y'all, y'all understand what I'm saying up in here tonight, right? It costs something to be part of a church that teaches the full gospel. What do you mean, Pastor? The full gospel meaning repent. Like, you, you are saved when you repent and are baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. That's the full gospel. Death, burial, and resurrection, the real true plan of salvation, it costs. All right? Let me, let me show you how it costs. Because it turns people off. Because the majority, come on now, the majority of the church world, world believes you saved when you say the sinner's prayer. I can't. Even, I don't even know. I haven't memorized it because I don't believe in it. Yeah, <laughs> like, 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 like the, uh, the majority. And I mean, I guess it's kind of scary. It's, it's very scary, you know, because you got millions of people thinking like they really born again, and they're not. See, the statement I'm saying right now, <laughs> that right there has just sliced the pie. You know what I'm saying? And 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 cause, causes uh, just this a cost, you know, because when you tell the truth. Either people going to accept it or reject it, you know? And so, so the reason why I'm painting that picture is like, it's not, a, 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 that's not even, that in itself will, will kind of slice down the line and there's a price paid from that. It turns people off. It costs something as well. Or y'all, y'all following me? It, it, somebody say cost. 
I want you to get that in your mind too. So there's this price we have to pay. It costs to be a part of a congregation like ours that teaches and models what? A separated lifestyle from the world. Come on, there's so many places that don't do that anymore, you know? And, 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 and it's going to get like that because we're in the last of the church age, you know? So it, it gets weaker and weaker and weaker, but there's still congregations like ourselves and many all throughout the world that not only preach, you know, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ and, and being born again through the true plan of salvation, but we also preach a separated lifestyle, not meaning we are monks up on a hill somewhere, on a mountain, in the snow, like dinging a bell. No, 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 we're in this world, but we're not of this world. And so that means there's, there's a lifestyle that I live that is different from someone else. And what, sh- what shouldn't be is, is one church has a different lifestyle than another. The body of Christ should, should all be the same. But we know that's not, you know, we, we, we understand what's going on. So, so that is another high price we pay. But that's okay. Like, we can't compromise on a separated lifestyle from the world. Separation from the world is very, it's a very clear and very timeless scriptural doctrine. It's, it's, it's from Old Testament and New Testament, but it's not culturally, culturally correct. Like separation from the world, it, 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 it goes against the grain of the culture. I mean, think about what's, what's one of the biggest words I hear right now, inclusiveness. Right? Jesus is inclusive and exclusive. He welcomes everybody, but he says, I am the way. There ain't no other way. You know what I'm saying? So, so separation is, is, is clear, but, but it's, it's not culturally collect, uh, correct. And um, churches like ourselves, they have the spirit of holiness about us. Right? That carries a spirit of conviction. Like if people come into our sanctuary, right, uh, in general, and let's say they're living a lifestyle of sin, Right? And not say to her, there, there should be some type of conviction that takes place. I'm going somewhere. I'm going to this whole discipleship thing with this. There should be a conviction that takes place. You, I, like, I didn't necessarily grow up in the church, but I went to a few churches when I was young, and I was doing everything you can imagine. I sitting up in that church, and I, had, like, I, I was half asleep trying to listen to whatever the man was saying. I, it was just, no conviction, no power. No, no, like, oh, Lord, like, like no talk of hell, no, none of that stuff. Like, like, we have that. All of this stuff is like prices we pay, amen, uh, for this discipleship walk we're on because it's an expectation of us. Now, I do have a bunch of scriptures for you tonight, so I hope you're ready to jot them down. And, and you know, I'm glad I said that. I want you all to be note takers on Wednesdays. So if you don't have a notepad or some means of taking notes, uh, next Wednesday, bring your notepads and stuff because note takers are history makers. Note takers are people that can go back and meditate on certain key things that, you know, you know you, you're not necessarily writing everything down, just the things that, that stand out, something God is dealing with you on. So, so, so make sure you're taking notes, man. I, w- I want you all to take notes because I got a bunch of scriptures for you all tonight uh, that I want to I talk just a little bit about um, and, and really help you get this understanding about the price that comes with discipleship, all right? Um, we expect people to dedicate their time and their talent and their treasures, right? Because that's scriptural. But we, we lack sometimes to cast vision in a way that equips everybody to be disciples. And this is what I'm doing is casting that vision um, about what this year of the pivot really looks like to be a disciple, all right? So let's take a look. I want you to look at what Jesus did here for a second. And uh, what's the first scripture we got up there? I want to make sure I'm on the same page with you. And Jesus said unto them, yeah, okay, good, good, good. Thank you, uh, Sister Dreer. So, <clears throat> so that, that scripture right there, then Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. Y'all see it on the screen, right? Drink his blood. You have no life in you, right? Is that what he said? Mm-hmm. That's John chapter 6, verse, verses 53 through 58. John chapter 6, 53 through 58. All right, most assuredly I say unto you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Mm -hmm. And I in him. 
okay? As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. Mm. Y'all count that? If we feed on him, our daily bread. <laughs> the brothers here last night know what I'm talking about. If we feed on Jesus, we'll live because of him. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Okay, now, now, I, now I want to pause here for a minute. I want you to understand in what he's saying, right? Jesus is talking about like all, everything we have is in him. Our whole life is in him. Our walk is in him. Our discipleship is in him. We only live in him, all right, if we partake of him. And be filled with him. So, but what I want you to understand is the reaction, because this is a call to commitment, is it not? This is a call to commitment. Yeah, this is a, this is, uh, he's telling these people, there's a price to this thing. Okay, this is a call to commitment. But look at the reactions in John chapter 6, verse 60 and 61. Many, therefore, of his disciples, his disciples, his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying. These were, dis yeah, these were disciples. But this is a hard saying. Like, who can hear it? Which, Minister Hicks, you're right. Who can understand it? So when Jesus, watch this, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples, the Bible says, murmured, Come on, that word is, is interesting because back all the way back in the Old Testament, they murmured and they got in trouble with God. They murmured when they were coming out of, uh, out of Egypt, and they murmured when they were in the wilderness, and they got in trouble with God, and they died off in the wilderness. When Jesus, now we're talking about New Testament now, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples, not, not just the, not the crowd, his disciples murmured at it. What does he say? <laughs> does this offend you? Oh, my gosh, man. Oh, my gosh. Does this offend you? Does this offend you? Does this offend you? Think about it. That's a question. Now, what does verse 66 say? From that time, many of his disciples went back. And walked no more with him. That's just what I was just talking about. When you lift the level of commitment, people go murmur. But the real disciples going to stand up. Man. So, 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 so from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Jesus understood that his mission well, he understood his mission and the people he needed for that mission. So, so, so me as your pastor, me as the pastor of this, uh, as the under shepherd of this ministry, understanding the mission of Jesus Christ, I understand the people it's going to take to fulfill the mission. That's why I've, I know this sounds so crazy because it's, it's a crazy statement to say. That's why I'm okay when I do see people leave. I, it doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt or, you know, but I get it because when the level of commitment goes up and there's some people I just know will never get to that level of commitment or some people are in a journey and they have to go through their journey to eventually get there. And my prayers is always, Lord, get them there. But I have to focus on here because we need people here like all of you that are at that level of commitment that are saying, okay, I'm here for the long haul. I'm here to do this thing. If we got another 20 years before the Lord come, I ain't going nowhere because I want to grow as a disciple. So, so, so are you offended? Woo, don't say, I'm just, put that in your heart. Ask yourself, are you offended by what Jesus is calling you to? What's what, what that? Say that? Let him, let him use you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Use us, Lord. Use us. Use us, Jesus. Use us. Yeah, so, so I don't want to fail at preaching commitment. Now, I'm not talking about, see, commitment and consistency is everything, you know, in the ministry. 
So I'm not, right now I'm not talking about the things like vacuuming the floors. I'm not talking about like cleaning the church and, and all the great things that all of you do. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because I remember when we first started, it was just me and the wife. We did all those things. And we still do that stuff, but it's nice to have folks like y'all to help get all the stuff in order, right? You know? So, so but I'm, that's not what we're talking about. Today. We're talking about making disciples, you know? So that's what we're really focused on. So we, we, when, when, when we fail to preach this level of commitment, we, I... I start with me, do Christ a disservice. I get in trouble staying with Jesus when I don't preach commitment. And I was like, Lord, I don't want to get in trouble. Lord, I don't want to get in trouble. I haven't been in too much trouble with you before. I do not want to get spanked. <laughs> you know, it ain't no fun. So I have to, I have to do Christ uh, rightly. And, and, and so, because if I don't ask for commitment from you, then we'll never build a congregation. Now, now I, I'm an evangelist. I'm a soul winner. I can, look, I can, I mean, I done got y'all up in here by the grace of God. But, you, but you know, I, it, it can't just be me. And it's, I, it's not. I'm not saying it is. But it just can't be me. And that's not how the church is designed. I'm here to equip you to build this congregation. So this time next year, Lord willing, Lord Terry, we can look at the congregation. It's going to look different. There's going to be so many different people up in here. Why? Because you got it. You lifted up the level of your commitment. Cost something. It really cost something. So we come to grips with this. We come to grips with this. Um, and Jesus, listen, Jesus wasn't pulling no punches at all, man. When he started talking about this and this cost that it would take to follow him, Matthew chapter 8, I think, is the next scripture. Yep, verses 18 through 22. Matthew 8, verses 18 through 22. And when Jesus saw, now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, okay, so he sees the crowd, he gave commandment to depart unto the other side, okay, and a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, (laughs) I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Jesus says unto him, the foxes have holes, I know he's so smooth. Jesus is so smooth. But the foxes have holes. And the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man, I don't even got a place to lay my head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer, or which means, Lord, allow me. Lord, allow me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. Now, that's a separation line right there. Because you say that to somebody today? <laughs> somebody that lost their dad or their mom or their sister, their cousin. You know, I said, hold on, pastor, let me go. Do-. And if I turned and said, follow me and let the dead bury the dead, then we're probably going to lose somebody, you know? But Jesus was really speaking deeper. He's like, he wasn't coddling nothing. He wasn't doing nothing. He spoke very plainly about the cost. He he was pointing out the cost of discipleship. The core idea of Christianity is not to be a church member, but a Christ follower. We are not called to be church members. We're, We're called to be Christ followers, disciples for the Lord. What does that mean? It means that we got to pattern our life after the life of the historic man named Jesus Christ. Like, have we studied Jesus? We study everything else. Have we studied the four Gospels? Have we studied the life of Christ? That's when the first uh, minister, Dweez, when, when I got saved, at Bible college up in Columbia was just kicking off, and you probably remember some of this stuff. And um, one of the first classes that I took I took an evangelism class, and I took the life of Christ. And it's where my pastor just taught on just Jesus' whole life. I, wasn't, I understood, it, like, the teaching was so good, but I, w- I didn't really get the fullness of why, like, the, what was being taught. The reason why I was being taught the life of Christ is because I'm supposed to model the same Christ that walked this earth. If he did this, I'm supposed to do this. If he did that... I'm supposed to, you're supposed to do that. 
You know, so those classes were something else, man. So we got to study Christ. We got to, and, and that means, watch this, that we have to pattern our life after him. And, and, and the problem with this pop-up Christianity that we have today is that people want to cherry pick scriptures. They want to find a scripture that good for them for the moment they're in, the time they're in, whatever they but they, but they don't want to read the next scripture and say the, the thing that they really need to deal with. Mm-mm-mm. We can't cherry pick scriptures. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> Even in the apostolic church is guilty of this. We, we, ooh, yeah. Uh oh, is right. Watch this. I'm gonna bust this cherry picking thing open. Cause we th- think about like we talk about. Okay, we we love who Christ is. We say uh, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Like Jesus Christ is God. You know, we we talk about the deity. We talk about you know who He is, and we 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 focus on His presence. We focus on His passion. All these things that. That are important, but then we know, like, how often do you hear people talking about discipleship? Cherry picking scriptures. The oneness of God, the oneness of God. Well, okay, that's great, but are we disciples of the Lord? We can't cherry pick. We got to eat the whole roll. <laughs> All right? So, 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 um, what do you think happens when there's a, a lack of discipleship in, in, in a person or a lack of discipleship in a church? What do y'all think happens? Y'all can talk. Church get weak. Amen, Elder Washington. Yes, sir. Church can get weak. What else? Uh, what's it? Falls apart. Grows. Yep, there's some stagnancy. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, what kind of people does it produce? Lukewarm. People that are out of balance. People that are out of balance. Double-minded, unhealthy saints. Just unhealthy. Imagine if a bodybuilder exercised only a half of his body. <laughs> ah! Lifting all the stuff with his arm, his right arm. That thing get all buff up and do all the other stuff and all. And he walk up and he flex him like BAM. <laughs> this side look like that, and this side all buff up. Something wrong with that picture, man. Something wrong with that picture. He's this weightlifter that's only ha- working half of his muscles, man. That, that ain't, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we pose like our doctrine. We the oneness of God. You know, we, 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 we believe in a death, burial, and resurrection. We believe in all these things are good now. Don't get me wrong. You know, like we got to flex that. But then the discipleship is like this. Yeah. Come on. Mm, Jesus Christ. Come on. It's Jesus Christ. See it? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's good. That's true. Yeah. Because when you're around people that are going up, people that don't want to go up don't want to be around people that are going up. When people are committed, the the people that have a lack of commitment don't want to be around that. And so they can't be around that but for so long until the rising tide lifts all ships. But some ships got holes in it. So when the ships lift, some do go under. With the t- look at somebody say, the tide is rising. <laughs> Woo! And only us can look at our ship and see what holds. What's that song they used to sing? Some, some, there's a leak in this old building, and my, my soul got to move. And this, my soul don't move like that, but I'm just saying. But you, you, know, you check yourself and say, am I ready to be lifted with this tide that's coming in? The pastor, God, through the pastor, is calling me to a level of commitment I've never had before. I, I don't want to be that person. Like, Lord, I believe, even if you got to be like that man, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. That's better than just dipping out. God wants us to get to a level of commitment and, and, and work all these muscles and be balanced. Yeah, not just, not just coming and flexing our Pentecostal power on a Sunday morning. Praise team. Going in hard, hallelujah, man. We've been having a good time. Flex, baptizing folk every Sunday morning. But then Monday through Saturday, we ain't doing nothing. That's that, that muscle builder. Mm-mm, we got to flex the whole thing. All right? In other words, we focus on Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, all the Beatitudes, but not, what real, not the other stuff that matters too. Like, it's like a lot of people say, hey, we pass out clothes. We give out food. Remember what the Lord said about that, sir. 
Many are going to do these things in my name, but I'm going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Why? Because what he's saying is like, you, you never got in a relationship with me, and you never did my will. <clears throat> you're thinking you're doing the will of God just because you're giving out clothes and even laying hands on a sick day. Recover. No, that, like, 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 it's more to it. There's so much more to it. Jesus Christ, oh, Lord, I'm going to get in trouble. Not with y'all. But Jesus Christ, I mean, yes, he came to heal the sick and all, but his main mission was to save souls. That was his mission, and it still is his mission. And in the midst of that, people get healed. In the midst of that, people get delivered. But his mission was not people getting healed. Because when souls get saved, all that other stuff comes, man. All that stuff comes. So the priority, again, of Jesus was this lost world that he came to save. He, he didn't come to this earth to feed us, clothe us. He came to save us. All right, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, talking about Jesus, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So that's something that Jesus came to do and is still doing today. That's been my prayer. Lord, baptize us with your Holy Ghost again. And those that ain't never been baptized with the Holy Ghost, baptize them with that Holy Ghost and fire. Because that's your mission, Jesus. That's your mission. All right? Uh, um, Matthew chapter 11 verse 19 says, The Son of Man, watch this, came eating and drinking and they said, Behold, a, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified over children. See, what they were saying, they were mocking the fact that this man did not have time to go up and sit up in the synagogue all day long and act super religious like the Pharisees and scribes were doing. He was out there with, with, the, with the people drinking the wine. <laughs> We talked about that last night, too. Amen. And, 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 and the publicans and the sinners, and he was doing the will. He was of his father. He came to save these people. He ain't got time for these religious folk. They, don't, they was just doing their religious stuff. He was walking in the thing that God called him to do. It, his priority for us, then, is for us to do the same thing he did. All right, to become his disciples and then turn around and make disciples. Jesus was not playing around. He had three years to get this thing done. He died at 33 years old, but he had three years of public ministry to get this thing done. He was not playing around. He, he was starting off early when he was 12 in the temple. When he told his mom and daddy, don't you know like, I must be about my father's business? Are we about our father's business or are we about our business? Are we about our kingdom? That's why I was praying tonight. Lord, let your kingdom come and my kingdom go. Oh, y'all ain't here. Let my, let my kingdom go. Let thy kingdom come, but let my kingdom go. I don't want no Abraham kingdom. I don't know. I want God's work done. His mission. That's the only somebody... Somebody, um, I reached out to somebody this week on Facebook, and, and I mentioned something to them. And I said, man, I can't wait to see this revival where God going to bring, like, white and black and all these people together, right? And, and he said, yes. He said something like that. And I was like, that's the only reason why I'm alive. That's the only reason why I'm breathing, man, is to do his mission. That's the only thing I care about seeing in this life. I love my family. I love my children. I care about those things because that's balanced. But the main reason I'm alive, the main reason you're alive, God saved you, is so you could be about your father's business. You might have to let something go that you're really passionate about. Oh, look at somebody say the cost of discipleship. Mm-hmm. God, I feel like preaching. I got to teach. Oh, time. Slow down. Mm-hmm. So the price of discipleship is high, but the cost, watch this, of our non-discipleship is higher. Got that in my notes. You can write that down too. The price of discipleship is high, but the cost of our non-discipleship is much higher. So, so there's a cost 
when you don't become disciples, all right? Now, now um, some prospective disciples of Christ disqualified themselves when they considered the cost, cost and they counted it too high to, to be, you know, that disciple. Jesus told one of his uh, uh, followers to do what? Sell all your possessions and then come follow me. But what happened? He walked away considering the cost. L- look at Luke chapter 14, verse 26, real quick here. Luke 14, 26 says, if, if any man come to me and hate not his father, oh, Lord, Jesus, that's a strong word. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife, hate his children and brethren and sisters, yeah, in his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That word hate isn't talking about hate, like what we said. I think I explained that a while back. It means that if we love these people more than we love God, then, then, then we can't be his disciple. That's deep. Some folk build churches off families. You got family churches out. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know what I'm talking about. A whole church built off a family. And if it ain't the family way, and you got some people that came in and ain't part of that family, and it, it, but God showing them something, they said, oh, man, shoot, they get shut down real quick. Mm-mm-mm. Being a disciple, though, is letting go of all of these things and paying the price to become. No, I feel like that's an intense verse. Like, I think this is an, an intense verse. Like, no church I've ever walked into in the lobby, you know, sometimes people have scriptures out there, like their mission. I've never seen this for no mission. You man, come to me. Hate your mom and daddy and sister brother. You probably walk around, oh, we got to go to another church. <laughs> daddy, you got to hate me, daddy. But this is the cost of discipleship, okay? Cost of discipleship. Um, <clears throat> Turn to Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Luke, Luke 9, 23, he says to them all, not some of them, to all of them, if any man, woman, anybody will come after me, let him what? Deny himself and take up his cross, how often? Daily. daily. And follow me. Deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, the word deny in the scripture means to resist, okay? It means to reject or refuse. So let's add that in there. If any man will come after me, let him resist himself. If any man will come after me, let him reject himself. If any man come after me, let him refuse Woo, himself. So to deny yourself doesn't mean to deny your appearance or your DNA, your pedigree, your career, emotions, all that stuff. Denying yourself means you have to dethrone yourself as Lord of your life. You got to dethrone yourself, take yourself off the throne of your life, is what he's saying. Take, remove yourself and deny yourself of your right to live selfishly. Y'all ain't catch that. Deny yourself of the right to live selfishly. Selfishly. Like resist the urge to live a selfish life. We reject that urge and 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 take on a uh, a life where God now becomes your Lord. He's our Savior, but is he our Lord? Two different things. He's our Savior, but has he really become our Lord, because again, before we can pray, before we can pray thy kingdom come, we got to let our kingdom go. And so, so anybody that's been in church a while understands that, 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 that God is really calling us to this next level and understands that, you know, it's not always going to happen for everybody, but we got to decide, you know, are we willing to pay the price, right? So are we willing to let go of like worldly hope? Oh, my God. Worldly hope, worldly ambitions, worldly dreams. Come on. But, but pastor, like, God want me to live a blessed life. Okay, yeah, what does that mean? A blessed life might be giving up on your worldly dream. 
When I say worldly, I mean like something that only pertains to this world. I don't want to do something, invest my energy and time into something my whole life, die, get to heaven, and Jesus is disappointed that I didn't let go of that worldly dream. If I get in, better hear my chinny chin chin. It, it, like, like, wouldn't that be a horrible feeling? And listen, that's going to happen to some folk. The Bible say that, that, that when we go before the Lord, we're going to be judged. We're going to be saved, but we're going to be judged for the works we've done in this world as saved Christians, you know? Some are going to um, suffer loss. Now, that's in the kingdom. You say, but you're going to suffer loss. I'm thinking there's a disappointment somebody's going to feel when they realize all of the stuff they clung to that had no eternal ramification, that did not do nothing for the kingdom of God. And honestly, all of us are guilty of that. All of us can look at something and Say, God, you know, I got to maybe let this go or, wow, why did I invest my time in that? And then we can redeem the time. But the whole idea is, you know, understanding this and, and making sure we don't fall into that category. So, 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 turn, all right, so turn to Matthew chapter 16, verse 25. We're almost done. <clears throat> Here, oh, yes, Ella Washington, go ahead. I'm going to take a sip of this good old Ella Berry tea. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You all right? Right. I think it, it goes back to balance. I, I, it's really balanced because, God, again, God didn't call us to be disciples that are hung, hung, uh, um, hunkered down in a bunker somewhere all to ourselves till Jesus come. Right. And he also didn't call us um, to be super, to just be so like in the world and of the world. We're in this world, but we're not of the world. He, he's called us out, but we're still here. <laughs> You know, so so you got this religious attitude where you know you know oh I can't mm, can't go around that mm, too sin like you wanting a nasty sinner you know what I'm saying like you wanting you know what I'm saying yeah, all of us was nasty sinners I don't care how cute you look coming out your mouth you was a you was a sinner <laughs> period head in the hell from from your first win you know what I'm saying like. So we can't ever, it's religious, it's, you know, just a way to, you know, doing things. That's why we got to teach this stuff so people understand. Jesus says here, Matthew 16, 25, for whosoever will save his life, watch this, shall lose it. Whoever is trying to save their life is going to lose it, and whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. That's not just talking about a physical martyrdom where you're killed for the, the preaching and spreading the gospel, it's talking about losing what I was just talking about, the selfish, worldly ambitions and all of our kingdoms we try to build. When we lose this life for the sake of Christ, that's when we find life. That's when we find the life. We find our lives in the context of this world, and we don't follow Christ. That ain't no life at all. You know what I'm saying? We, we, we ultimately lose everything when we do that, trying to find our purpose in the world's validation. I don't care if I impress nobody on my job. I don't care. I, don't even, I ain't living to impress nobody on my job. What I am living to do is maybe hope to be a witness and a light to somebody while I'm on my job, maybe be able to make a disciple in the corporate world. But I could care a hill of beans if somebody impressed with anything I do. I don't care about that. I don't need none of the world's validations. I want to make sure that Jesus says, well done. That's the one that counts. 
Because you either going to say, well done or not. You ain't do good. <laughs> well done or depart from me. Like, which one you want to hear Jesus say? I would rather, like Paul said, I would rather you just not like anything I pray. I would rather not. I don't want any of your accolades. As long, if, if I can please God, that's what matters. That's what matters. Nothing else that matters. Because I, I always used to say this too. I, I used to think this. I was like, Lord, if I'm pleasing you, then everybody else that's in you will be pleased. And then those that aren't, who cares? <laughs> I don't care if they ain't pleased because you ain't doing the will of God. If I'm doing the will of God and you got a problem with it, that's your problem, not mine. <laughs> I'm glad to be doing the will of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I told somebody today. I told somebody today I had to do the will of God. Somebody asked me a question today. Are you still part of this, this organization? Mm-mm. And I said, like, but I still, I'm doing the will of God. But I've still got the whole scriptures, everything. But I had to follow the leading of God. And they was like, amen. And like they got it. They were happy because they understood. But, you know, some people will be like, mm. You know, the fake that. Oh, I'm happy for you. No, they ain't. They liars. See, dead through that stuff. I can see dead through people when I was in the streets. I, I can see even more now because I got the Holy Ghost, man. You know when somebody be giving you fake accolades and go behind your back. But who cares? Just do God's will. You may lose friendship. You may lose family. But you're supposed to lose family because you got a new family. You my blood brother if you saved. You my blood sister if you saved. And I love, listen, I love my mom and daddy. <laughs> I love my, 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 my biological family. Don't get it twisted. I love them. But y'all <laughs> are more family than they are. I'm part of the body of Christ. That's my family forever. It's much bigger and better. Mm. Now, when your family gets into the family, that's a beautiful thing. But you might lose family. But whoever shall save his life, going to lose it. Whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. When we lose our life for his sake, what we're doing is we're leaving all of that stuff behind. And we're giving it up, and we're investing in the gospel. We're investing in this mission. We, 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 we're doing the purpose and the will of the Lord. We're living this. I believe that's what the scripture means. When Jesus says he come, that you might have what? And life more what? Abundant life is just that. When you lose your life, you get abundant life. That's abundant life. It ain't the money. It ain't the blessings. No, abundant life is when we're willing to lose our life and become disciples for the Lord. Ain't nothing like it. Ain't nothing in the world like it, man. Nothing like it when we lose absolutely everything and leave it all behind. I uh, got a note down here. There's a really question for us. How could we lose our life any more? Uh, than when we deny ourselves of our own agenda. How can we lose it? You know what I'm saying? Like how can we lose our life any more than when we, like, we, stop, we, we let go of our agenda? We let go of our own calendar. <laughs> oh, my Lord, Jesus. We, we, when we let go of our own resources... Our resources, God will always take. Remember, Jesus said, I ain't got a place to lay to my head. <laughs> oh, God, I got to. Oh, God, I don't know why I'm like this. But I know, I know. But it's like some people don't like because, well, not y'all, I'm just, I just speak in general. I be thinking about so many things. I'm, I'm very, I don't know if it's transparent. Sometimes so super transparent, people like, dang, you like really transparent. <laughs> <laughs> like, you tell them the whole lot. But I've been struggling with something for a while. Oh, Lord Jesus. Yeah, I just might as well. I might as well admit it. Because I got corrected by God on it, so I might as well admit it. So y'all know my whole housing situation, right? It's just blessing, first of all. I live with my 
my mom and my daddy right there. You know, can we praise God, Deacon Johnson? Listen, this man is so strong. <laughs> I, I just like, I, I ain't got it worse. That's, that's just, that's my dad, man. And, um, but, you know, the Lord blessed my wife and I to be able to come live with them because, you know, some things happened with our house and all that. But, you know, I mean, I'm a 40-something-year-old man, too. I'm like, Lord, I, you know, I need my house, man. I need a house. I need a house. And I've been working really hard doing the things I need to do to get my house, you know. But I've been focusing mentally on that, like, from the crack of dawn when I wake up to, like, when I go to sleep thinking about that. I'm serious. And not just thinking, like, I need a house, but then thinking, like, like, uh, like, you know, you can, when, when you don't see something happen that you know God said it's going to happen, but it don't happen, that, you start doubting things, you start doubting God, you start wondering, or you start looking at yourself bad, you know, all these things, you know what I'm saying, all this stuff. And watch this now. I was doing that so much to where, what's today, Wednesday, to, to Monday, God said, you know what, let me, let, let me backtrack. Before Monday came, I've been saying, Lord, I don't want another, this is what I've been praying, deep. I don't want another prophecy from you. <laughs> I know, I know, y'all. I'm just telling it. I'm just telling you. I'm teaching. This is part of discipleship now. I don't want no more prophecies from not one more person, Lord. I don't want no word of knowledge. I'm done. I don't want to hear nothing from nobody. Until, until all, if, if all the things God has told me through these people come to pass, I don't need no more. Like, oh, my gosh. You know what I'm saying? Like, Jesus. God corrected. Ooh, your past, he corrected my past. Thank you, Jesus. Ooh, I love it, too. I mean, it was tough because I was boo-hoo crying when it happened. But I got a call in that office because the other night, like, I was just sitting in my office. I didn't want to go home. Like, I wanted to go home, but I didn't want to go home because I was just in this place. Where, like, I couldn't, I couldn't shake it, man. I just could not shake. Why is, why is this happening? Why is it? And, like, I got a call, and this man of God, I was on the phone with for, like, two hours. And I am not lying. I wish he was here tonight. He would be cracking up. For, like, probably the first hour, I was rolling my eyes. He didn't even know it. I was like, I love him, but I don't even want to hear none of this. I'm just so tired of it, Lord. <laughs> I'm done. Then, I don't even remember. He said something. The Lord had him say something. And that thing hit my core, boy. And, but, but, and it hit my corner in the sense of, God, this is good. Like, while I've been grateful, I was realizing I was going into an ungrateful place. Come on, y'all. Like, you know what I'm saying? It was crazy. I was like, and I, like, I really didn't realize it because, like, I'm super grateful, you know? But I was realizing that the way of thinking was just like clogging up the things that got like getting in my way. It, it, it was it was watch this putting my king, my kingdom before his, and I didn't even realize it. Your own pastor, I didn't even realize it. I was really putting my kingdom before his, and the way you know as a father does with a son, just ministers and corrects me and teaches me, and I got a breakthrough on Monday, man. It was a blessing. And the reason why I said that is this scripture brought me back to that. This scripture brought me back to that. And this is what it takes, watch this, to be a disciple. Is you're going to have some moments like that. Where God, when God calls you to another level of commitment, he's really, really is testing to see, are you really letting go of all of these other things? Because remember, if we do that and we seek him first, all these other things going to come. If it's meant to be, it's going to be meant to be. But, if, but, but we got to really, like we can say it, but then we got to really, like I've been saying it. Oh, seek ye first, seek ye. And I do, you know, but, but then the other flesh side of me wasn't, you know, it was this battle within. And thank God he showed me that so I could say, okay, how do I really put myself into the, to your will, Lord? This was Monday. And then Monday night, oh, my gosh, y'all, I'm almost done. I promise you I'm almost done. Monday night, like 12, 1 in the morning, I'm studying the Word of God. I told the brothers this last night. I'm probably going to end up preaching on this Sunday. I don't know yet. But we pray this prayer, give us this day our what? Mm -hmm. And, and, and you, you know, like when a caterpillar turns to a butterfly, that's a beautiful transformation, Right? 
there's caterpillars that are destined to be butterflies, right? So, like, I, I was given an example last night. What if I had a pill, though, that made, like, if I gave that caterpillar, he turns into a butterfly, right? That caterpillar has this beautiful transition or transformation. But then, like, but instead of giving him that pill, I give him another pill. Watch this. And he cocoons and, and becomes a moth. That caterpillar thinks he's a butterfly, but he's a moth. Because that real transforma- that full transformation had to take place. That happens with us with the word of God sometimes. Though. Every scripture was written for us to have a real true transformation. Right. In the translation of scriptures, some of the ideas aren't carried. So when it says, give us this day, this, is, I mean, this all ties in because you know, God, God was ministering to me. Give us this day our daily bread. That word daily is found nowhere else in the scriptures in the original text. Nowhere. So when they translated that word into daily, they put daily in, uh, so we could just put our own interpretation on it. Right? So we think, give us this daily bread. We think about food. We think, I always think about the word of God. And what the Lord showed me that when, when, they, when the archaeologists excavated um, some text 100 so or so years after Christ, they found that, word, that same word daily in the text, and they, they found out that what that word means. It means poor man's bread. That's what that word daily means. That's crazy. Poor man's bread. Poor man's bread was in the Jewish custom. They had this leftover stuffed meal, or whatever, that they would piece together this, this bread that the poor beggars would come to and, you know, open their hands and they would give them this bread. And if they didn't devour that bread, consume it immediately, it was so brittle that it would fall apart and they would lose their sustenance they needed physically. Okay, y'all catching this? So give us this day our daily bread. Like, like, are we getting enough of the bread of the word? Jesus Christ said, I'm the bread that came from heaven. I just read, that was the scripture I opened up with. I'm the bread that came from heaven. I'm the true bread that came from heaven. Yes. We're poor in the spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. So we're poor beggars in a sense. I need the word of God, and I, well, I need to consume it immediately so that I have what I need this day. And we can consume, like what I was doing, all these other thoughts and not consuming enough of that what we need and then start trying to build our own kingdom. So what I'm saying tonight is like when we get to a place where God lifts up our level of commitment and we understand the cost, it starts to become okay because we realize, yes, we're losing things, but what we're really doing is we're gaining Christ. We're gaining life. We're gaining everything pertaining to life and godliness when we chase after him. Do we go after Jesus like the poor man, the poor begging man for that bread every morning when we wake up, when we go to sleep at night? Are we going after him? Are we going after him? So this is what discipleship is all about. Like, like, like it's what is, 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 is are we disciples? Uh, are we making disciples? Are we losing uh, our lives and our, and our agendas? Are we willing to let go of this stuff? Are we willing to just let God do with us what he wants to do with us. Because I'm telling you, as we lift this level of commitment, that's what we're doing. And we start doing this, and we start chasing after God more, and we start realizing it's about these souls that are out here, and it's about all these people. And we start making a disciple here and a disciple there. And we start really making disciples, we're going to see, we're going to see the manifestation of the kingdom of God in our life like we've never seen before. But it's going to cost something. It's going to cost you something different maybe than you, and, but it's, it's going to cost us all something, Sister Trey. Amen. Mm, amen. by sleeping in this kingdom. Yeah, I know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. Like, a lot of people don't know how to let go, but, like, I mean, it starts with like what we're talking about. It starts with the salvation, and then it starts with once you're saved, like, then there's still more letting go, you know? It's like you start realizing how much you do have to let go of certain things, you know? And so, yeah, it's, it's not. It's, it's not easy at all. I mean, think about this for a moment, and then we can go, but think about, the, like, the whole just take up your cross and follow me. Get, if in Jerusalem, if you saw somebody with a cross, that's a dead man walking. That's a dead man walking. Jesus is saying, take up your cross and follow me. In other words, deny yourself, you know, kill yourself daily. Crucify yourself, your flesh, your lust every single day. He said that to the church. He wasn't saying that to sinners. He wrote that to the church. Crucify yourself, carry a cross daily, church. Because there's still, even though you say there's still, still some stuff that needed to die, there's some, some selfish ambitions and will and things like that, and they needed to be killed. And it don't happen every overnight. You know, sometimes it's a whole process. Sometimes you get the quick deliverance. Sometimes it's a process. Amen, Minister Dewey. <clears throat> I also want to thank you for being so uh, That's all right. That's okay. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And there's more stories to come from Minister Dewey. 
Come on. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I like, and I like that because that, that came to my heart, too, the whole idolatry thing. Like, like you can focus on something so much to where it becomes an idol, you don't even realize it. And honestly, that's what I was doing, man, your past. <laughs> but, you know, again, that's part of the process, man. It's a, it, I think the most beautiful thing about those, like, these stories and the stories we go through is the fact that God deals with us on it. He don't just let us, because he sees, like, we're, we're, we are stepping up to the commitment, but, but we're still, we, we're, it's a process. Everybody's in a process. But now this whole level of commitment is being lifted up, so we're all going to be going through some processes, but, you know, it's okay. Just, just let that, that rising tide lift you up. Don't have, pass them holes in your ship or ask God to do it, but let's, let's lift, lift our level of commitment up in this house, specifically, you know, really relating to discipleship making. That's what I really want you to get. What, like, were you committed in becoming a disciple? You know, how, where, where's your level at that, of commitment at there? And where's your level of commitment at making disciples? You know, and let go of the fears of not knowing how, the fears of my qualified, you know, all the things to go through. God can deal with you. So Elder Washington and then Sister Geneva Johnson. No, no, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. <laughs> right, right. Mm-hmm. Let the gas fillers fill the tank. And follow me. No, I'm just kidding. You know, like, I'll just take it. Let the dead bury the dead. <laughs> I'm just playing. <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> right, 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 right. That was so good yesterday. That was awesome. God never exposes without covering. Like, he, he reveals stuff that you struggle with, you know? So you go back to discipleship and all that. He does this stuff, but he always covers us. He protects us in it. 
Yeah. Yeah. All right, Sister Johnson. <laughs> That's fine. We can. We can. <laughs> it is. Yeah, that's when he did. <laughs> God some praise, man. It's, it's a price, a high price for discipleship, but it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth giving up everything for for Him, and um and and that's the joy I love is when I see the saints of God uh, as we journey through our life. We 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 catch this and we do it. You know, yeah, I, I love it, man. But brother, I know you ain't gonna.